Hello, my name is Kathleen Mugrich, and I'm the Director of Programs and Education for the Army Historical Foundation and your host for Army Artifacts, a program that demonstrates Army history can be found everywhere. Today, we're going to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to the Harley-Davidson Museum, where we will be talking about Harley-Davidson and World War II with our guest, Christopher Ripstein, who is the head of the museum's collection department. Christopher, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Now, before recording this episode, Christopher and I spoke briefly about all the things Harley Davidson did during World War II. And unfortunately, this is a very brief program. But can you start us off by summarizing what Harley did, not just for the Army, but for other services as well? Sure. Um, shortly after Pearl Harbor, Harley Davidson was well on their way towards an all out program of military motorcycle production. Uh, but the efforts weren't just limited to motorcycles, as you mentioned. Uh, in addition, Harley-Davidson produced more than 13,000 truck winch transmissions, uh, thousands of Navy electrical switch box covers, and, and hundreds of pieces of miscellaneous uh, war subcontracts, ranging from shell parts to small fittings, uh, even for the B-29 Super Fortress. Uh, so we weren't just motorcycles during that time, but we for sure were, were focusing on our bread and butter more than anything, which, which was building motorcycles. Um, but what's, what's cool is we didn't just stop after World War II. We actually continued to support the military for another 50, 50 plus years. Um, and actually our factory in York, Pennsylvania, where we build our motorcycles, it's our assembly plant, it actually started in the World War II time period where it was building ordinances for the military. And one thing, in particular, we were building were these 500-pound bomb casings. Um, now, we weren't building the whole bomb, to be clear. Right? The uh, nose cone, the tail sections, the, the explosive, that was all subcontracted somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but they were using these for training purposes. And in later years, we were actually developing and supporting the Navy with uh, rocket engines uh, for a supersonic drone missile that was called the Jayhawk. Uh, but similar to that bomb casing, it was just, just for training purposes. Wow, so Harley-Davidson was all over the map being able to help the military everywhere. As much as we can. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, but I know one motorcycle we want to focus on is the WLA model, 66,000 of which were produced and sent overseas. Now, for those of you who just heard that number and immediately jumped online to get an original, Christopher told me earlier, they're still over there. Say a prayer and maybe you'll find one over there. Um, but to start off, for people like me who are not as familiar with motorcycles, what does WLA stand for? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to try and keep this brief. <laughs> uh, but WLA <laughs> is an alphanumerical code that we can use to identify a specific model. Uh, and we've been doing this a long time, actually, since 1909, the motor company um, was differentiating between different model configurations by assigning letters after the model number. And that did work for a while until about 1919 when we had so many different model options that many of the bikes uh, only had one or two small offerings that were different from the base model. So it made sense to start adding extra letters after the model designation. So I would, I would say that this is kind of where that alphabet soup story begins. Uh, and it is a tradition that we've carried through all the way to present day. Um, so with that backstory, WLA uh, is broken down as follows. W um, identifies mm -hmm. the bike as having a 45 cubic inch flathead engine. The L indicates that the engine was outfitted with high compression pistons. And the A is in refer reference to it being an army vehicle. Now, what was its purpose in World War II? Well, I, let's maybe we should start by saying what it wasn't, <laughs> a lot, because there has definitely been a myth surrounding the WLA for a long time in reference to it being a cavalry vehicle, which, mm -hmm. quite frankly, it's it's just that it's a myth. Because um, oh, when you think about it's all cavalry, over the posters, people on know, motorcycles, well, guns, they're everywhere. I'm looking at like there's one. I think there's one behind you, right in the exhibit. It's, it's easy to yeah. I mean, super easy to get that conclusion. Um, because when you do think about cavalry, this image comes to mind of these heroic individuals that are leading mm -hmm. the charge in battle astride a horse, right? So it's not so far-fetched to envision a soldier mounted on a motorcycle doing the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But re reality was, 
the WLAs were used as dispatch vehicles, reconnaissance, and courier missions. Um, they were super rugged, very nimble, and, and reliable. So the WLA was this perfect vehicle for relocation and speedy communication between the Allied forces. So, so not a cavalry vehicle, though like many myths, there is a shard of truth behind any of them. Um, the cavalry myth probably stems from the armor school at Fort Knox, though, which is where the Army's motorcycle field training occurred. This is where um, soldiers learned not only how to ride, but also take care and do maintenance on their motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And what's unique to it, or I guess where this truth might come from, is these uh, this armor school at Fort Knox is where there was 200 Harley-Davidson motorcycles for training that actually replaced the horses that were part of their cavalry division there in Fort Knox. So that might be where some of the truth stems from. I'm sure there's also a Hollywood movie of some John Wayne-esque character riding on a motorcycle. And now I'm going <laughs> to get a ton of comments in the comments section saying, it's this movie, it's this movie, it's, or you don't know what you're talking about, which is also highly true. That just means it's All right. <laughs> now, um, I see it's behind you. This is the w WLA behind you. Right there. Ah, gorgeous. Now, where would we find that in World War II? Asian, Pacific, European theater, where was this? Yeah, it was it was honestly all over the place. Uh, it wasn't Europe. Uh, we did have some in you know Australia, Africa, but where it was mostly found uh, was in Europe. Uh, but there was actually a good amount of them that stayed stateside um, because these were commonly used on military bases for the MPs, the military police. Oh, very nice. Um, and also, you mentioned that it has an interesting nickname, the Liberator. Now, I know we just got away from the fact that it's not a cavalry based purpose motorcycle. So where does the Liberator come from? Well, I suppose that one has a little more solid footing in comparison <laughs> to the cavalry map, um, as these two-wheel vehicles definitely did not go unnoticed in Europe. Uh, so oftentimes, a soldier running a reconnaissance mission on his WLA was the first ally to be seen in some of these war-torn towns and villages. Uh, so that site may have been very real realistic, very, very liberating, like let's go right to it, liberating and hopeful for the villagers. So we can easily see how the WLA probably got its liberator nickname through mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the military, but but some of the towns and the villagers that we were encountering overseas. And how does this particular motorcycle compare with the non-military motorcycles that Harley is making at the time? So the WLA was, in essence, a specialized military-equipped WL model that mm -hmm. was offered to the public since 1937. Uh, besides the obvious olive drab color, uh, the WLA was outfitted with uh, a Thompson machine gun scabbard and ammo box on the front forks. Uh, it had cold weather windshield and lower leg shields to protect the rider during some of those winter months. The front and rear fenders changed from this familiar Art Deco style to a more uh, simplistic and higher raised fender that was really barely skirted. Um, they honestly looked more like they came off a tractor or should have been on a tractor. Uh, but the reason for it being is, so there was to reduce any clogging of mud that could build up in there as okay. they're riding through some of the muddier terrains. Um, it had saddlebags, as you can see, which were actually mm -hmm. designed to military specs so that they could stow uh, the appropriate size documents that they needed during their courier missions between posts. It had a full tool roll and toolkit in case the rider needed to make repairs on the road. In terms of performance improvements, the WLA had an oil bath air cleaner to filter out dust from the roads, a blackout headlamp and tail lamp uh, to hide their themselves from aerial reconnaissance at night, and it had a skid plate underneath the bike to protect the crankcase from any rocks that the soldier might encounter. Um, and lastly, what's kind of unique to the WLA uh, was the lack of rubber components, actually, because rubber, as you know, was one of the many materials that were reserved for war efforts. So the mm -hmm. WLA actually had metal floorboards, uh, a synthetic blend tire, and uh, plastic grips on the handlebars. Wow. Now, since you're the head of museum collections, someone's going to ask me this, and I want to know. Are all the motorcycles maintained to the point where if you had to, like the zombie apocalypse is coming, y'all can just hop on those motorcycles and get out? 
uh, it's a little more than just putting gas in them. <laughs> but I would say, um, I couldn't give you a percentage, but a huge number of our vehicles here, uh, mm -hmm. by adding battery, adding oils, adding fuel, uh, we could fire them up and, and take off. Wow. I mean, I've been to this museum, for those of you watching, and everything is just so pristine. It literally looks like you could just pick it up and go. Now, in addition to the manufacturing of the WLA um, and other military motorcycles and all the other efforts that Harley did, which seems amazing, um, just knowing a little bit of what I know about Harley themselves and where the manufacturing is taking place, you mentioned that Harley also did something to support their workers who were drafted and their families. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so it definitely rings home to me as an employee of the motor company. Um, what the motor company did uh, for their staff during the war. Um, so every employee that was drafted or volunteered for service uh, left with a cash bonus and a promise that their position would be there for them when they returned from duty. Uh, and in fact, there was a flag that flew at our headquarters with the number 535 on it, uh, which represented the number of employees that went overseas to fight. So the motor company was very proud of them. Um, but additionally from there, it, a lot of spouses of those individuals and servicemen mm -hmm. became employed at the motor company in their absence. Um, and it, it didn't matter what their trade or skill sets were, there was something for everyone to do at the factory to support the war effort. So many of them worked in packaging departments where they wrapped uh, parts in Cosmoly so that they would arrive overseas undamaged from the salty air. And, and I really do like to think a lot of them took a lot of great pride in their work, knowing that their efforts were supporting their loved ones overseas. And it, it wasn't just our customers and employees that were supported. Um, Harley Davidson made sure pre-war riders serving in the armed forces continued to receive their issues of the Enthusiast magazine, regardless of where they were in the world, uh, which was a magazine that was first published by Harley Davidson in 1916 and showcase mm -hmm. the culture and lifestyle that surrounds the brand. And it was really cherished by our customers. So we were proud to say um, that we could still get it in the hands of those servicemen overseas because uh, there was really no location too remote for us to get that coveted magazine to them. And many soldiers and sailors uh, shared a lot of fond memories of pre-war motorcycling and stayed connected with activities back home through those pages. So. It was something simple but very meaningful that the motor company has done, not only for its employees, but um, for our customers and our riders that we're serving. And of course, getting mail while you're overseas is just just one of those small things you just appreciate so much more because it reminds you of home. That's such a special note. Um, we could probably go on and on all day about talking about all the things Harley did. I didn't realize they were still sending magazines to the front. That's amazing. Um, so we know that Harley Davidson is still thriving, very recognizable, obviously. But did the WLA have any effect on Harley, the production, consumer demands after the war? Yeah, hugely. Uh, countless soldiers that return from war, uh, similar today, they seek out adrenaline filled activities with their fellow veterans. And mm -hmm. after seeing how reliable and tough the WLAs were during the war, uh, purchasing a Harley Davidson made perfect sense for them. And, and in fact, surplus motorcycles were sold after World War II uh, by the War Assets Administration to returning veterans pretty cheap. There was like 375 bucks they could buy one of these. Uh, and so many soldiers took advantage of that opportunity and quickly oh, yeah. would strip them down of excess weight, uh, mm -hmm. chop or bob the fenders, um, which was a customizing aspect of what they're doing, personalizing it, and it really kind of started the bobber craze that a lot of motorcycles enthusiasts recognize. So subsequently, these cost-effective motorcycles, individuals repurposing their military clothing as riding gear, and this community of fellow veterans, motorcycle clubs naturally formed and continue to this present day. So individuals that found themselves involved in these motorcycle communities obviously became lifelong riders, and then they would tend to buy new motorcycles every year or every couple of years, which is what we need and what we want. 
Now, because I'm not a motorcycle rider or enthusiast or member of a Harley owners group, um, can you go back to the Chopper Bob comment and just explain a little more <laughs> about what that means? Sure. It was literally just a way to, to lighten the bike, add some flair and some characteristic to it. So it's literally they were chopping the fenders or bobbing them. Oh, short. okay. Similar to oh, okay. haircuts, you bob your hair. Oh, uh, same okay. thing. There was a bobbing of the fenders. Um, it, it was a craze, just like we go through year after year in the motorcycle industry. So I wasn't sure if it was going to be one of those things like Sailor Jerry tattoos that we were going <laughs> to learn some nice little quip or story. So why is the WLA and Harley Davidson, why in their efforts in World War II, which are much more expansive than just sending motorcycles overseas, why are these stories important in history? Well, I mean, it's a piece of our history that mm -hmm. was a big part of defining our legacy. And for us, our legacy is everything because it is a standard of excellence that our customers expect and deserve. Um, the WLA was a bike that was born out of necessity, but over delivered in its capabilities. And this is by no means my proclamation, but the voices of the individuals that spent their time in World War II astride the WLA. Uh, within our archives, we have countless letters from soldiers writing in great reverence uh, for the WLA. And for them to utilize those precious, that precious space in their letters, right? Talking about letters mm -hmm. home and receiving oh, yeah. letters. It, was, it meant everything to them. So for them to take this precious spot or space within the letters um, to highlight their admiration for their Harley Davidson, it meant that that motorcycle was so much more to them than just a machine. Mm -hmm. it, it was their partner and they relied on their partner for their lives. And per their words, that WLA kept them safe and over delivered time and time again. So I, I could easily brag about you know, the Army Navy E flag that hung at our headquarters with three awarded stars mm -hmm. co commending the motor company on its support through the war, but it really doesn't carry the weight of those letters written home from these, these servicemen um, to their loved ones uh, about how much they love that, w, that WLA and their Harley Davidson. Um, but by no means would I also say that World War II is where it kicked off our, a point in our company's history that sparked this consistent adoration our customers have for their Harley Davidson motorcycles. But the response from the motor company at a time of need to produce such a reliable motorcycle has really echoed through the generations. And, and our motorcycles were and still are seen as a symbol of freedom. And Harley Davidson to this day continues to build more than just a machine. So what does the museum have coming up in 2024? I know last year you just celebrated the 120th anniversary. So yeah. what's coming up? <laughs> There's always something happening uh, here <laughs> at the museum. Um, our exhibits are, are ever evolving and we've always got some new bikes coming in. So even if you've been here before, there's always going to be something new to see. Um, I mean, what people don't realize is uh, that the museum's a 20-acre compound. Uh, we have more than just a world-class museum here. We have two great retail spaces. We have an excellent uh, restaurant. You could really make a day of it here. Um, but events-wise, we have above and beyond our normal wow factor that we do every day in our everyday operations. We have weekly bike nights and concert series that happen that will draw in hundreds and hundreds of motorcycles every Thursday night, and they'll start in April, uh, or no, May, sorry. They kick off in May and, and run until September. Uh, we have demo rides, so if you come here and you get inspired and you say, you know, maybe I do want to ride a Harley, we, we offer people to ride the 2024 models uh, every Saturday mm -hmm. for free. You can take whatever one you want um, and, and get your hands on the motorcycle and, and get some time in the seat to experience the bike. Uh, but like you said, we had our 120th anniversary mm -hmm. last year, which was a big celebration, and we're we're looking to have that happen every year. We do have a rally in Milwaukee every year that really could help anyone get fully immersed into that Harley Davidson experience. Um, and I'd highly recommend uh, any of us uh, attending that annual homecoming festival that we have every year, and that's going to take place this year, July 25th through the 28th. Great. 
Now, I want to thank Christopher for joining us today on Army Artifacts. And if you'd like to learn more about Harley-Davidson Museum and all the events they have coming up, um, please visit their website. And I will say one more added thing about their site that he didn't mention that's very important for city locations, free parking. Oh, yeah. Free parking. Big parking lot. It's easy to find a spot, and it's actually easy to find when you're navigating the city. And if you're in the area, I would highly recommend visiting. You don't even need to be a Harley owner. I don't have a Harley. I don't, I've never ridden one. There's something there for everyone. The museum has really, really high quality exhibits with interactives to demonstrate how motorcycles move, work, all the stories about the people who have ridden them either as a hobby or as a sport, all that just evolved from just this tiny little wooden shed. Uh, I spent hours there the last time I was there. And I think one of my favorite parts in this museum was um, all the little old motorcycle toys because I had some of them, but they're in all these little cases and drawers uh, just to show how Harley Davidson and motorcycles appear in pop culture and how it influences and plays off each other. And of course my husband's favorite part, we weren't there for a demo ride, but he was able to get on a current mo model Harley Davidson. So that made him very, very happy. And Again, Christopher, is there anything else you want to add or say before we close our program? No, thank you for having me. Um, appreciate it and appreciate everything you do. Well, again, thank you. I want to thank Christopher and everyone who helped him set up this nice space in the exhibit so we can actually see a piece of the inside um, and for sharing the stories of Harley Davidson during World War II. And if you'd like this episode, please click like and subscribe, and you can support programming and the Army Historical Foundation's mission by donating at www.armyhistory.org. Thank you for joining us.